that up perhaps during the lunch hour. I am uh, actually very pleased uh, to welcome you to this morning's panel on a critical overview of domestic and hybrid justice efforts. As you might have heard from my introductory remarks this morning, while the ICC may just be vital to ending impunity for senior leaders in societies devastated by violence, it cannot be expected uh, to transform societies. Justice initiatives at or close to home will continue to play an important role in the developing architecture of international justice. Some models have worked better than others, uh, but the good news is that we have not yet ex uh, exhausted the types of models that could move the justice project forward. Some have pointed uh, to the war crime section of the State Court of Bosnia that we've heard about this morning, uh, created with the support of the Yugoslav Tribunal and other international actors, as a good model. Other more recent innovations include the establishment of a court in Senegal, where former Chadian dictator Hassan Habre is being tried by African judges with financial support from Europe and the AU. We have with us today an extremely distinguished panel of speakers who will introduce us to a variety of these models and help us understand what has worked well and what hasn't. My hope is to engage them in a conversation about these models and to save some time at the end uh, for some questions. I will introduce them to you very briefly, but really in the interest of time, I encourage you to read uh, their full bios and uh, comprehensive contributions in the program materials. Let me start uh, with Eric Witte, who is Senior Project Manager on National Trials of Grave Crimes at the Open Society Justice Initiative. As you can see, Eric is joining us uh, via Skype today as he was scheduled to leave from the Brussels airport, which closed due to the tragic events of last week there. Uh, we are fortunate and grateful that he is safe and his family is safe and that he can join us via Skype today. Eric, can you hear me? I can. Can you hear me? Excellent. So, Eric, you have worked with a number of different hybrid and domestic models over the years. Can you start us off with an overview of the various models that have been used to date and what lessons can be drawn from these models regarding criteria that should be considered in the design of accountability mass mechanisms at or close to home? Sure. Uh, thank you, Susanna. I'm sorry I can't be there in person. Um, so we frequently discuss uh, uh, a few models, but there's a surprising range of experience that's been gained over the past 20 years. Um, and uh, so we're looking, uh, we're doing a publication up uh, sometime later this year that seeks to synthesize lessons learned from all of these models, and it's over 30 uh, uh, proposed and actualized models um, that we're drawing on. Uh, and these range from a pretty much pure domestic proceedings where there is very little uh, international assistance, like in Argentina, um, through internationalized domestic models, uh, as in Basel, um, to form uh, hybrid models like Special Court for Sierra Leone and up to the ad hoc tribunals, the ICTY and ICTR. Um, but, you know, there have been experiences in East Timor, Kosovo, Serbia, uh, Uganda, uh, the hybrid court that you mentioned in Senegal. Um, we've had local courts in Eastern Congo, um, and, and the list goes on. Um, CICIG in Guatemala, which I understand was discussed a bit earlier with uh, Claudia Pazi Paz, uh, is an interesting model, even though grave crimes were not part of its mandate. Um, but as I believe she said, uh, that CICIG nonetheless had a, had a tremendous impact on her ability to pursue grave crimes cases in Guatemala. Um, and as for criteria, I think we can look at, at some basic. Um, Basic questions: uh, you know, How much intrusiveness is is really necessary on the part of the international community? And this should be based on an assessment of political will and technical capacities. Um, and just looking back, you might say that uh, in Cambodia, the extraordinary chambers and the courts of Cambodia maybe had more uh, international intrusiveness than was the case. Um, and in Sierra Leone, perhaps, uh, even though I think the special court was uh, uh, quite a successful model, 
um, perhaps it could have done with less intrusiveness and more national involvement. Um, another key question is how to maximize the spillover benefits of these models. Uh, how do you tap into existing uh, rule of law programming, rule of law development programming, instead of starting from scratch? Um, how does the model you create, you know, can it be effective in providing services of the, of the justice system um, so that it has uh, support from a broader range of domestic stakeholders and, and of donors for that matter? Um, and, and make it more sustainable. So, for example, uh, can a model provide witness protection services outside of its core mandate? Um, can its detention facility, if, if one is being built for it, um, assist other key uh, organs of the, of the justice sector? Um, how do you make the model accessible to affected communities, I think is a key question, and how can that be um, built in. Um, and if there is to be international involvement, what steps can be taken to mitigate the natural resentments that can arise uh, through that involvement? So I think those are some. I think the list is a bit longer than that. Thank you, uh, Eric. I wonder uh, if you can say a little bit more about this question of sustainability. If, for instance, the model uh, was set up with significant international support, uh, how should that support, should it be phased out and how? Uh, and what should be put in place in order to ensure that the mechanism is able to continue to operate once international uh, support drops off? Sure. So sustainability, I think, is a key question. And um, also for, for getting international support to create these models in the first place. Um, and I think at the outset, we need to say, you know, the goal shouldn't be necessarily to create many ICCs with all of the bells and whistles, um, the high tech courtroom, etc. cetera. Uh, it's really not appropriate in many locations, um, especially for lower level perpetrators. Some of these cases can be actually quite straightforward. Um, we've seen in the Congo uh, with the mobile courts, even though uh, those trials have not been perfect, um, you've seen application of the Roma statute uh, in very remote villages under very basic circumstances. And I think it shows that international justice uh, it can adapt and, and doesn't need to be so high tech. Um, I think Bosnia provides an important lesson for uh, the, the phase, built in phase out of international actors. Um, and it's useful to have that built in at the outset and pegged, I think, not to timelines where you could have obstructionists try to wait out timelines, but pegged to other reforms in the justice sector. And that, that provides perhaps added incentive to realize other reforms. Uh, for example, um, in Bosnia, the uh, High Judicial and Prosecutorial Council um, was realized and then took over the recruitment of international judges um, and, and as one part of the, uh, the transition to domestic, uh, being purely domestic. Um, Another key thing, I think, is security for judges, uh, that that could be thought through at the beginning. Um, what mechanisms could be put in place in Guatemala? CICIG has been, uh, was instrumental in, in creating these high-risk courts uh, that have been useful for high-profile corruption cases, but also grave crimes cases linked to the conflict. Um, and a lot more thought needs to be put into how you get the right internationals involved in these mechanisms. Um, create environment for skills transfer. Um, as I said before, there's a natural, uh, there are natural resentments that can, can arise when internationals are brought into a domestic system. Um, I think actually uh, pay should be reduced. Uh, there's this tendency to, to offer tremendously high salaries for international staff. Uh, that's a huge um, bone of contention and, and cause of resentment. Um, and it attracts some of the wrong people uh, who are only there for the high pay and don't really believe in the, in the mission. Um, 
led to ensure the recruitment of internationals who are willing to work within that country's legal system and not come promoting their own country's legal system, uh, you know, trying to bring plea bargaining into an inquisitorial system, for example. Um, it needs to be made clear at the outset that the internationals are not there to sort of bestow wisdom on the benighted locals, but um, also to learn themselves and um, that this is a, a two-way uh, learning opportunity, I think, could be driven home by having the national judges, for example, train the international judges off the bat uh, in the local criminal procedure code and criminal um, criminal codes. Uh, so I think there are a range of things, measures that could be taken um, to improve the quality of internationals, to improve the environment for collaborative uh, work that leads to um, good skills transfer. Thank you, Eric. Uh, one last question, which is, um, I wonder if you could conclude with some of the cautionary tales. In other words, what and how can we avoid, um, you know, repeating ineffective strategies? Sure. Um, I'll just briefly touch on some, but uh, I think Canberra is an obvious one. Uh, um, where you've had a government that's only willing to have the, the model pursue a very limited um, sense of justice. Um, so not making it the international aspect robust enough in that case. Um, you've had experiences in Iraq uh, with the Iraqi High Tribunal, in Libya and in Bangladesh where domestic trials uh, have been bound together with rights abuses, with unfair proceedings. Um, and I think maybe uh, more international pressure in each of the situations could have been brought to bear to avert some of those problems. Um, in, the, in creating a mechanism, I think we've seen that it's not helpful if the mandate is too short. Uh, for example, again in Guatemala, CICIG had a two-year mandate and of, after each year into its, its remote mandate, it had to keep fighting for, for new extensions, wasted a lot of time and energy. Um, again, in, in Sierra Leone, I think there were missed opportunities to leave more of a legacy. Uh, it had the ability in the statute to use domestic law, um, the indictments did not draw on domestic law at all. Uh, in practice at the court, even though it was hybrid staff, a lot of the Sierra Leonean cards uh, were marginalized uh, in the day-to-day -day work. Um, I think in Uganda we've seen that uh, limited political will uh, can really you, you create quite a nice institution and there are a lot of things that were done right in designing and building that, that international crimes division, um, but it really hasn't had more than one case and it's not even clear that that can proceed very far. Um, again, uh, international staff, as I was saying earlier, yeah, I think that's a cautionary tale. Each of these, there have been horror stories in all of these institutions, even as I should say, uh, there have been tremendous individuals involved in all of them as well. Um, and, and finally, I would just say, uh, especially when internationals are involved, there needs to be a guarantee that there's proper oversight and accountability mechanisms for those internationals. Um, including codes of conduct uh, and policies on sexual harassment. And that's something, for example, in Sierra Leone, that was missing when it came back to bite us at one point. Um, and I think uh, very foreseeably so. But um, those are, I think, some of the cautionary tales. Thank you, uh, Eric, so much for getting us started uh, with the broad view of, uh, of uh, models, the difference uh, in models, some of the criteria and some of the challenges. Let me turn around to uh, Reed Brady, uh, counsel and spokesperson uh, at Human Rights Watch. Uh, Reed, you've worked with victims of the uh, exiled former dictator of Chad, uh, Hassan Habre, for years. Uh, he's now finally being tried at the Extraordinary African Chambers in Senegal, uh, the first trial in Africa for serious crimes based on universal jurisdiction. Can you start us off by telling us a little bit about how the EAC came into being, and particularly the role of victims in the creation of that model? Sure, thank you very much. Um, well, 
the, the Australian African chambers, as I'll explain, are kind of an, an, an accidental court. Um, but uh, as you point out, the victims in this case have really been um, the architects um, of, of, of this effort in a way that I think, I mean, I think it's also very similar to the case of, of Rios Mont in Guatemala that, that Claudia Passi Pass talked about, but very different from many of the other cases we're describing them. It was the victims not only who filed the original complaint against Hiss and Habre under the French Parti Civil system in Senegal 16 years ago, um, but the victims who basically fought relentlessly for 16 years um, to, to make this happen. And when the case was thrown out uh, in Senegal, uh, the victims filed a case under Belgium's universal jurisdiction law to keep it going. Um, when President Wad uh, threatened to, to expel Hissen Habre from Senegal, um, the victim sees the, the Committee Against Torture. In fact, we got Claudio Grossman uh, in, in very involved in this case uh, uh, when, when the Committee Against Torture uh, ruled that, that Senegal could not let Hissen Habre leave the country until there was an extradition request. Um, when the Belgian law uh, was, was repealed uh, because of all the political pressure from the United States and Israel and elsewhere, the victims went to Belgium um, and got a, a grandfather clause for the Hiss and Habre case so that it, it could survive the repeal of the um, universal jurisdiction law. Um, Belgium requested Habre's extradition. Um, uh, Senegal refused uh, and handed and, 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 and brought the case to the African Union. Um, uh, we worked, and, and, and the victims, and, and, and myself, and, and the lawyer, Jacqueline Mudena, a very heroic uh, Chadian lawyer who was almost assassinated by, by one of Habre's accomplices, um, worked to, to turn the African Union actually into an ally um, uh, in, in, in bringing Habre to justice. Um, when Senegal still refused um, to move forward, uh, Belgium took Senegal as, as, as uh, I think it was uh, Steve Rapp described earlier this morning, uh, Belgium actually took Senegal to the International Court of Justice. Um, that didn't happen in a vacuum. It happened because uh, the victims had created a political constituency from, Fl from Flemish conservatives to, to Wallonian socialists. There was actually a, a constituency in, Sen in, in Belgium that, that, provoked, that pushed for Belgium to take Senegal to the International Court of Justice. Um, the, uh, the f and ultimately what, uh, what happened is, uh, this is very complicated, but Senegal, but Hissen Habre went to the ECOWAS Court of Justice, which issued a bizarre ruling saying that he, Habre could only be tried before an international, uh, an ad hoc court of international character. And that's when this kind of accidental court, um, uh, came came about it, that decision from ECOWAS was came down the same week as Stephen Rapp was in was in Dakar uh, at a funding meeting for the court, and we knew at that point that we had ten million dollars to work with. And as everybody in this room knows, you don't create an international tribunal for ten million dollars, but we did. Um, the African Union again pushed forward a proposal that basically said, you see the Senegalese court over here? Well, we're going to put an African president on it from another African country. We're going to create an international treaty and an international statute, and we're going to call it an African court. And, and, and that's, you know, that's how the court came about. Um, but I also want to say that the, 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 the role of the victims um, also transcended into how the case was was um, that, that the dynamics of the case itself. Um, it was very much perceived in Africa, in Senegal, as the victims um, versus Hissen Habre, Suleiman Gengeng, Klema Abayfuta versus Hissen Habre. And, and I think that's another dynamic that you often miss. I mean, when, when Omar al Bashir was running out of uh, South Africa, one of the things that struck me was that it was framed as Bashir against the ICC, Bashir against the prosecutor, but not Bashir against his victims. Um, I also think, you know, sorry if I'm taking a little time, but 
many of you, Bob, know, know very well Roberto Garaton. Roberto Garaton had been the um, special, had been the, the legal director of the Vicary of Solidarity in Chile under Pinochet. And when we were working on the Pinochet case, we, Human Rights Watch brought Roberto to, uh, to work on the case with us in London. And at, and, and at the time, he was the special rapporteur on Zaire, which the DRC. And he said, you know, Reed, I was, um, I can tell you that under Pinochet, there were 1,032 people who were disappeared. And I know every one of them. I have their names, I have their pictures, I know their stories. There were, what, 2,012 people killed. Not huge numbers, by the way, compared to other things. Um, and I, I have their names, I know who they are. I'm the special rapporteur now on Zaire. I can't tell you if there's one million people who've been killed, or two million people who've been killed, or five million people. And I, I, I thought about that a lot. And, and it occurred to me that that is why Pinochet was being prosecuted and not Mobutu. Because the Chilean victims had names, they were activists, we knew who they were, they, they fought to, 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 so that everybody knew who Pinochet was. And I think we, that's a dynamic that we see, we see it in the Rios Mont case, we see it in, in the Hiss and Habre case. One last thing, I also think that that also had a lot to do with how the, those cases were structured. I mean, when I saw the Rios Mont case, I, to me that was a model prosecution. The way the choices were made, um, the way that the, the communities were selected, the way they were involved. Um, in Hiss and Habre also, in a sense, um, you know, from the very beginning, the victim said, we want this case to be about not just these victims here in the north, but, but every victimized group under Habre. I'm not going to go into detail, but Zahawa, the Hajarais, the people in the south, the political prisoners. And I also find that that's very different from, you know, at the, at the, at, I, international justice tends to be very uneven. I mean, we've seen in the Congo cases where, you know, very tailored small prosecutions in order to, 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 to get convictions that leave a larger community outside. And, and I think, again, the, the role of the victims can assure a certain accountability from the prosecutor towards uh, the victim community. So uh, just a couple of other uh, reflections I might ask on your experience. What, what lessons do you think can be drawn? And this is a unique court, as you say. Uh, but what lessons can, you, can be drawn from the experience with the EAC, especially in the context of a tribunal that is set up in the domestic system of a country different uh, from where the affected population lives? And maybe the flip side to that uh, question, uh, or maybe part of that question, is what do you think have been some of the most significant challenges thus far in the trial? Well, I think, you know, this, this is a case that we always imagined would be tried in the Senegalese judiciary. And as I said, for, for, for the, because of this ECOWAS decision, there had to be this hybrid court. But basically, it, the hybrid court was able to, to, to be a very light hybrid court because the Senegalese judiciary uh, is functional. It's one of the most advanced uh, in Africa. I mean, this case could have been, I mean, it's not the same as South Sudan or the CAR. I mean, here, basically, it's, it's the Senegalese judiciary doing it. And, and it required, though, extraordinary political will by, by the current government of Senegal. I mean, the nemesis, I mean, Basically, if you look at the timeline of this case, you see that Aubrey was indicted, then you had President Wad for 12 years, and then, and then you had Macky Sall, who immediately restarted things and, 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 and put a huge um, uh, political effort, including the Minister of Justice, and of course now Siddiqui Kaba, who's the head of the uh, Assembly of State Parties, the Minister of Justice, an enormous political will in Senegal to make this happen. And, and, and I think it's, it's you know, We've been calling, and, and Ambassador Rapp has been several times to Senegal. He's even been to Chad. I, um, uh, uh, you know, I think the downside is um, perhaps Chad's role. I mean, Chad is not a, you know, it's not a function. I mean, they're having elections in, in, in next weekend, but practically nobody, um, you know, I, I'm sure, you know, it's, the guy's been there for 25 years. Let's just put it that way. Um, 
But because this is a trial in Senegal related to Chad, of course, Chad is the territorial state. All the witnesses are there, all of the evidence is there, and Chad has been increasingly parsimonious in, in, in supporting the court. Um, one of the big problems we've had is that all of the insiders um, who have been actually convicted in a separate proceeding in Chad were not made available to the court. And that's, a, that's what uh, Ambassador Rapp went to Chad to talk about. Um, uh, so, you know, it really depends on the cooperation of the territorial state in many ways. Um, one positive lesson has been the importance of, of television and outreach. So this, this trial was, was live streamed, three cameras, very I mean, surprisingly good um, technology. Um, uh, uh, it, was, it was, the Chadians watched it. Um, the day, the, the following day. I mean, if, if we were upset with the Chadian government for not allowing the insiders, we were very pleased that the Chadian government allowed it to be on TV. And, and so you had, you know, tens of thousands of Chadians watching their former dictator in the dock. And not in the dock because their current dictator wanted him to particularly to be in the dock or because a prosecutor in The Hague wanted him in the dock, but because people came out of prison and, 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 and join forces with, with these local heroes um, and with international organizations to put that dictator in the dock. And I think that is a very inspirational message to, to, to the people of Chad and, 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 and elsewhere. Thank you. Uh, what an uh, interesting, uh, unique story, but interesting, and I think uh, with, with some lessons about political will, uh, the importance of political will, and the importance of resources and outreach. Um, let me move on to our third panelist, uh, Olivia Kambara, uh, who is currently Deputy Chief of Party for Chechi and Company Consulting, Inc. on the USAID uh, Mali Justice Project, and former Mali Country Director with the American Bar Association's uh, Rule of Law Initiative. Olivia, you have worked uh, on domestic justice efforts in Mali and in the DRC. Um, these are both countries in which there are current active investigations uh, by the International Criminal Court. And I wonder if you could give us some background on the domestic efforts being pursued there and how they relate to the ongoing ICC investigations and prosecutions. Well, thank you very much, Susanna. I'll perhaps start by thanking the ABA colleague who uh, uh, Betsy Anderson, who made my participation possible. So I left Debbie uh, Holy, and I also have to say that I'm not making any statement on behalf of uh, Chucky Consulting, but on my position as law flow expert. And I'll also maybe focus more on Mali because the, the issues are very are very broad. Uh, what, what I should say is that Mali is a country where there is an ongoing conflict. And this is quite uh, a, an important parameter to take into consideration to see what's going to be happening in efforts to bring to uh, uh, to account those who committed or those who allegedly committed uh, atrocities. Because now, because there is a peace process in place, those people are the partners in the peace process, and uh, there have been waves of uh, releasing uh, uh, people who have been detained uh, 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 because of the conflict. And some of them have been detained, although there were some kind of ongoing uh, criminal proceedings against those people. So as if you want to see a little bit of uh, the level of uh, seriousness of the state of Mali to prosecute people, I think you can get a, um, uh, a picture. Because most, most of those who have been released uh, were released because the prosecutor wanted to do so without informing the judge. Because normally the judge takes the decision to see people, thank you the prosecutor. And it, it became political decisions. Um, I mean, what you will want to know as well is because it is an ongoing conflict, uh, it's very difficult to really gather evidence of uh, the atrocities that, um, uh, 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 I mean, that people would like to see prosecuted. And the International Criminal Court is unable to conduct prosecutions because most of the crimes were in the north, and the Malian judiciary, which is based mostly in Bamako, cannot also conduct uh, investigation. So most of the time, the cases, the files are pretty much empty. So there is not a lot to work with. There is not a lot to move the cases uh, forward. And as you can also imagine, uh, there is a, 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 a peace process which always comes with the 
whole package of uh, the demobilization um, and the reintegration process, uh, the alleged perpetrators are returning into the places where they committed atrocities and actually put in very uh, difficult situation, insecurity, actually. And then, you know, uh, it's not a type of uh, formal kind of, uh, it's not a conventional kind of uh, uh, insurrection that's taking place there. Some kind of asymmetric attacks involving Al Qaeda and other um, uh, uh, kind of uh, jihadist groups. So the situation is very volatile and it's quite problematic. It's very difficult to kind of imagine how both international and uh, domestic uh, um, prosecution can actually move forward. But the ICC has actually managed to, to have its first case, uh, and that's the case against Al, Al Mahdi, and that's the, the case for the, the war crime for the destruction of um, uh, <clears throat> the universal and religious patrimony of Northern Mali, which is, for the international criminal law, a huge uh, kind of uh, leap forward, but quite a number of questions posed for the victims, because in this specific case, um, yeah, in this specific case, who are the victims? Uh, and I mean, it's great to have this prosecution for the destruction of some kind of tombs and the uh, uh, the, the, the universal patrimony of UNESCO, but the victims are pretty much um, not present, honestly. And uh, uh, in terms of uh, the relevance also of the person who has been uh, kind of inducted, uh, Al Mahdi is a very, it's an unknown person, someone who doesn't really hold any sort of political clout for the conflict. In terms of the terrorists, you really must find that is a waste and indictment can change anything. There's no one who's going, no party will feel uh, affected by the arrest and indictment of, uh, of uh, Al Mahdi. So I think for me, this is really a very initial step towards kind of bringing to account those who committed atrocities in Mali. And I hope it's a long way to go. Things are going to get certainly better, but it's really, it will depend on the improvement of the security the security condition in Mali, because so far, as we say, it's very volatile. Last week, in the middle of Bamako, um, uh, two people attacked a European, European kind of uh, training camp for Germans. So inside, people attacked in the middle of Bamako around two o'clock in the afternoon. So that's Bamako, but in the north, it's even worse. People are are, are not able really to, to to do business as usual. And uh, the state of Mali has not redeployed totally into the territory formerly occupied by the rebel and the jihadist movement. So I think things are very volatile now, and I'm not really optimistic as to where, um, in the near future, those efforts are going to go. Maybe you could uh, say a word then about, given the complexity of the situation that you just described, maybe you could say a word about the role of the international community in the support of both the domestic uh, efforts as well as uh, the ICC in bringing uh, cases beyond uh, the case against Ahmadi that you mentioned. Um, and then maybe um, as a final uh, question, you, you've spoken and argued for the need uh, for a comprehensive approach uh, in the design and implementation of domestic justice efforts. And I wondered if you could maybe talk a little bit about what you mean uh, specifically by that. I talked to you about the, the possibility or the role of the international community. That there are a number of difficulties that prosecution of international crimes is really facing in Mali. One of them is the legal framework. The legal framework in Mali is not conducive to prosecute international crimes. Although Mali sent a referral to the International Criminal Court, uh, a blank referral, Mali still has not domesticated the home statute, which means that there are plenty of uh, obstacles in uh, the Malian legal framework for prosecutions, uh, immunities, amnesties, etc. And I think also Mali has that system that is called um, not only partie civile, but a, a system that recognizes what they call uh, assise, called assise, which makes categorization of different uh, kind of a degree of uh, offenses and then crimes fall under the jurisdiction of, of what they call assize, and assize starts at the level of for the appeal court, and for the assize proceedings, there is no appeal. So meaning that if people are actually tried for war crimes in Mali, 
they'll be tried at the level of the appeals and there won't be of their seats and there won't be any option for people to kind of appeal the decision. So in terms of uh, due process and actually really stand up for uh, uh, prosecution of those international crimes, they will be allowed to say. Uh, the international, of course, uh, have an important role to play, but as I really frame it, um, it's in the context of uh, the war on terror. There is ongoing and really active French military operations against jihadists in northern Mali, which comes with um, all sorts of arrests, detentions, without really outside really the, judi the, the local justice system, so which actually said that there are a lot of uh, improvement that the international community can do to actually push for proper prosecution of uh, international crime domestically but also internationally. So there has to be, I'm not going to say political will, but there has to be that commitment first uh, to kind of get the whole system in Mali be able to prosecute uh, the Malians, uh, the foreign fighters, uh, jihadists, or any other that commit atrocities uh, in, uh, uh, in Mali. And then you will want also to see a strong civil society supporting, like in the case of Chad, a civil society really play an important role, uh, like the likes of Jacqueline Mudina, to really push for the victims to be organized, um, really become a force to, to count with. Uh, in Mali, civil society is uh, relatively very weak, and there is also a little bit of a sense of uh, not national agenda in Mali because most of the victims are the victims of the north and most of strong NGOs are in the south or in the capital we still have to build a, a, a kind of a bridge to make a prosecution or the fight for the victim a national agenda. What I was talking about the need for a comprehensive agenda is that I mean in a place like Mali where you can only do less with the less options that you have we need to constructively think of uh, what kind of uh, accountability can work. Because in the end, what victims want is its accountability. They don't want any perpetrators to remain um, uh, untouched. Mm -hmm. And now with all processes of uh, DDR, the, post or the, the peace process, there, there will be a lot of options where the perpetrators, high level perpetrators will be getting into government or will be getting senior position in the army to jeopardize even the victim's right for justice more. So one may want to think of uh, some sort of uh, vetting mechanism into the security sector reform in incorporating the, the combatant into public life, ensuring that uh, no perpetrator with blood in his hand will be incorporated. And what one may also want to see a very comprehensive kind of um, accountability system that will bring in as well the domestic or the traditional mechanism of accountability, for that sake, because the North, in Northern Mali, lots of our community have actually stood against the perpetrators, and now it will be a, a great opportunity for the international community, for a system that will recognize that the, the traditional uh, means of accountability are not a substitute to the criminal one, but they can play an important role in terms of sidelining those who committed atrocities. And one also want to take uh, a role for the Truth, Justice, and uh, Reconciliation Commission that has been created because it's going to do investigations. How those investigations could be already first steps for establishing accountability and reparation for the victim. Thank you, uh, Olivier, uh, for the comprehensive uh, remarks on uh, on Mali. Let me uh, now give the floor to David uh, Mandel Anthony, who is Senior Policy Advisor at the U.S. Department of State's uh, Office of Global Criminal Justice. David, uh, you have also worked with a number of different models, including the International Crimes Division uh, that we heard about in uh, Eric's remarks of the High Court of Uganda and the Special Criminal Court of the Central African Republic. Um, can you tell us a little bit about how those models differ from the ones we've discussed so far and what, in your view, are the takeaways in terms of criteria, again, that should be considered in the design and uh, of the domestic tribunal designed to prosecute these kinds of atrocity crimes? Sure. Uh, thank you, Susanna. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. and. Uh, uh, more than a little bit daunting to look around the room and see so many of you with uh, 
incredible wisdom and experience. It's always good to know your audience. In fact, when I speak on a panel, I'm always reminded of Reed, uh, who a few years ago on a panel uh, was describing the Habre story and uh, described the ecowash judgment as bizarre and added a few other choice adjectives. And uh, unbeknownst to Reed, the authoring judge of the opinion was in the front <laughs> row. Uh, so I know some of you, but not all of you. Um, <laughs> Um, indeed, uh, glad to speak a bit about the Ugandan International Crimes Division and also the newly created or newly established but perhaps not yet created Special Criminal Court of the Central African Republic. The ICD in Uganda is a purely domestic model uh, with only domestic judges, prosecutors, investigators who would sit in it, but um, like many other national uh, specialized units to prosecute these atrocity crimes, it has benefited from uh, a huge amount of international um, assistance uh, in the form of training, capacity building, um, and, and the like. Um, and I think that there are some cautionary lessons to learn uh, about this model. The, the absence of internationals in formal positions in the court uh, I think um, meant that perhaps when difficult political decisions needed to be made about the scope of the court's investigations and jurisdiction, uh, it was it was it was harder for internationals to to push the system to look at uh, the the whole range of actors, including state actors who were alleged to have committed some violations. Um, I also think there are some lessons in Uganda about um, getting the legal framework right. So the court was stood up by judicial administrative decree, uh, not by legislation. Uh, and the, uh, the, the staffing, the selection of judges and prosecutors and a dedicated unit was all in place. There were many organizations that were providing training uh, uh, on aspects of international law and criminal procedure to the members of the court. And when it came time to open the first trial of a defendant they had in custody, uh, an LRA commander, Thomas Coelho, um, the trial was immediately uh, adjourned while, while the issue of an existing amnesty law was litigated through the court system. Uh, the amnesty law was written uh, almost as a blanket amnesty law, and it took three and a half years for, for that case to wind its way through the system. It, ultimately, the Supreme Court of Uganda did rule that the amnesty law could not cover uh, serious international crimes. Um, but the, the large gap really lost a lot of momentum for the courts, um, and it lost a lot of donor enthusiasm it lost a lot, frankly, of, of public engagement because people did not understand whether there was going to be trials or not. Uh, and I think this is a lesson that sometimes you have to get the legal framework correct um, in order to have an effective and credible institution. Uh, in, in the Central African Republic, um, last June 2015, the transitional parliament uh, Transitional National Council passed a law establishing a special criminal court that will be based in the domestic legal system uh, that will be staffed largely by domestic judges, prosecutors, and investigators, uh, and which will use CAR uh, criminal law and procedure. Um, the law provides for um, some international judges uh, and prosecutors and crucially a deputy international registrar to also be formally appointed to the court. Um, and I think what, what this, um, to put it in context, is, is pointing towards is that in, on the spectrum of purely international courts and purely domestic courts, um, we're seeing the trend land much more on the domestic side. And this is uh, akin to the Senegal uh, Extraordinary African Chambers and others. Um, and I would say that the, the court in CAR reflected recognition by the national authorities um, and a political will on their part that their system simply did not have the capacity 
um, to investigate and prosecute these complex crimes on their own. Uh, that's also the reason why the national authorities uh, referred their country to the jurisdiction of the International Criminal Court, effectively saying, uh, come, come one, come all, we need, we need all of these institutions to help us ensure accountability. Um, Sure. Um, in Uganda, there are two aspects uh, present in the domestic criminal procedure law, which, uh, which the, the designers of the court took full advantage of. Uh, the first is the existence of what are known as assessors in Uganda, and this is essentially a lay jury who are chosen through a, a process similar to voir dire, uh, who um, are present during the trial, uh, who provide a non-binding advisory opinion to the judges, uh, and who are chosen mostly because of their, um, the respect they have in their communities. Um, this is a potential tool, I think, uh, to increase public participation in, in these often very complex trials and to serve as intermediaries to the communities that they come from. Uh, the other actually was, the other provision was uh, put in the judicial administrative decree uh, creating the International Crimes Division, and that is something called a user's committee, um, which is supposed to be uh, comprised of a number of stakeholders, including members of the public. Um, and uh, the purpose of that body is to um, advise members of the court, um, uh, to, to uh, conduct outreach activities to communities, um, and what this really, I think, whatever form victim participation takes in a, in a trial, the mantra of all of these courts must be outreach, outreach, outreach. Um, and it's really it, not just an, a nice to have, as um, many donors actually would, would um, put it in their funding priorities, but it's essential that if a court operating in a post-conflict environment is to gain legitimacy among the, the members of the public that it, it has to, uh, that the public have to perceive it to be just and to perceive it to be credible. Um, and uh, the best and most effective way to gain credibility is, is by having victims participate in all stages from the design of the mechanism um, through the, the, the life of the trials themselves. Or we open it up. We plenty of time. We didn't get a chance to measure the ability. A little bit about this. What lessons do you have in our experience uh, about the city? Uh, in the Uganda context, I've mentioned in case you. Uh, is it about uh, how many other So I'd like to return to the spillover effect that, that Eric spoke about. And I think this is a really crucial element to think about in terms of sustainability and, and also in terms of uh, selling selling these models, as Ambassador Rapp put it, to development actors. Um, you know, one way to measure the success of a specialized court created to prosecute atrocity crimes is through the number of investigations and prosecutions that it, that it achieves. But another way uh, might be to look at the, the process by which it helps to improve the overall rule of law framework and to improve the capacity of the judicial system. 
And I think more, uh, more concrete uh, examples of how these specialized courts can do that need to be put in front of development funders and rule of law funders. And to throw a few out there directly, um, you know, the, the development of a prosecutorial and investigative strategy um, is not something, as Olivier alluded, uh, oftentimes investigations um, in, the, in the DRC begin after a defendant is in custody and not before. Um, and there needs to be, many of these systems don't have the sort of systematic approach to prioritizing their prosecutorial resources um, that Attorney General Pazi Paz brought uh, to, to great effect in, in the high-risk chambers. Um, also, the development of things like witness and uh, protection strategies and training. Um, you know, most of the countries that we've spoken about today, when when the atrocities ended, did not have any effective system for victim and witness protection. I, I would submit that many of us can think of these specialized courts as hopefully innovation labs where we develop proper procedures for investigations, victim and witness protection, evidence management, archives, and even um, engagement with the public, which is uh, somewhat alien concept in many legal systems um, to have the prosecutor go out uh, and, and meet with victim communities and explain what is going on in trials and to listen to their concerns. Um, so I, I would submit that, that um, one way to measure sustainability is by uh, ensuring that these courts develop uh, procedures that will outlast any particular trial um, that they may undergo. Uh, again, if you want to know, I want to ask the panelists as a whole um, one final question. You talked a little bit about skills. Uh, I wonder if I could open that. Uh, and that ensure is clear from the outcome. Maybe you talk about that. There are other things that we want to keep in mind very helpful. What do we want to be careful to avoid as we think about engaging about uh, design, innovation? Design. <laughs> Is the question what what models can be used? Cautionary tales. <laughs> um, well. I think that if we're going to bridge this gap between the funders of uh, rule of law development and uh, international criminal justice, we have to uh, we have to think clearly about about some cautionary tales from the past, where um, frankly some of the international tribunals were not designed to have long-term impact in the domestic systems of the places where the crimes were committed. Uh, and it's a bit unfair to, to measure them by that stick since that wasn't the initial objective. Um, I, you know, it, it became more true with the ICTY and the ICTR as they began their, their closure process uh, and eventually resulting in, in the state courts of the, of the Bosnia and Herzegovina. Um, I, I would say in terms of cautionary tales, um, there's, uh, in Uganda, lessons to be learned uh, and elsewhere about, about the limits of political will to, to investigate um, non-state act to investigate state actors. Uh, and uh, there's, there's something to be said for the presence of internationals to ensure that political wills uh, transcend uh, their, their their normal positions, but I'll leave it at that. Um, yeah, when you talk about the minimum, I first of all have to say fair trial, um, uh, something sometimes we forget. Um, victims participation, I mean, I, I described, you know, our experience in the Habre case, the case in Guatemala, 
where I just I just felt that the, these the victims' voices. Uh, actually, the New York Times just said that in in, in an op-ed that term talking about the Harbury trial that never in a trial for mass crimes have the victims' voices been so dominant. But I also felt that in in the Rios Mont trial, um, you know, they were they you you could hear them very loud, and and I think you know there's something to be said for the Parti Civil model. Um, uh, that that the civil law systems have um, outreach. Um, you know these. I, I think the 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 fact that that Guatemalans could watch this trial could on you know on TV um, that it was held in Guatemala. In, you know in, in an incredible atmosphere. The fact that the um, you know, these are these are very important. Um, very important now. Obviously, a trial, I mean, it happens that I think both the Rios Montreal and the Hombre trial had very dramatic moments. Um, watching ICC trials, sorry, they tend to be like watching the grass grow, and, and, and they take very long. But that, that talks about the need for summaries and, and, for, and for, you know, having an outreach program that puts these together in a way that, that, that is, you know, interesting for people. Um, to me, sustainability is, I mean, sustainability is important, but, but what really sustains these kinds of efforts is the inspiration that has gotten. The, the fact that people see that other people like them are fighting and achieving justice. Um, and that's, you know, that's what, I mean, I have to say that when I showed, uh, some of you will have seen the Pam uh, Yates and Paco de Onis's films about the Guatemala trial. When I showed that to victims in Chad, it was like, yes, that's what we want to do. Um, and earlier I had shown a rabbito, a, ha a Haitian trial to, to the, and the more, the more you see that it is possible to achieve justice, the more you are inspired at, to, 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 to take those steps. But the final thing I would talk about is, is, is gender crimes. Um, it was, I mean, I spent 16 years working with Hiss and Habre's victims, and it was only on the eve of the trial and during the trial itself, actually, that we, re we Human Rights Watch, realized how many people had been raped in prisons. Um, even though the people who we, we sent to interview women were women. Um, and, you know, it, it's, I, lo I learned a huge lesson about really pushing for stuff. Um, and that was the big news of the Habre trial was the sexual slavery. Hissen Habre was accused to have raped people personally. Um, things that we didn't know were coming. But I mean, for me, um, I gotta say we need to have a more in-depth reform of our domestic uh, criminal systems. Um, I, will, I would not really see positive kind of expansion of uh, the model of uh, the African Union uh, chamber in Senegal in other countries uh, because there are so many countries where those kind of prosecution ought to take place. And if we go by developing all those models, it will just become impossible to manage them if the domestic system is not uh, kind of uh, uplifted to uh, actually have uh, international uh, standards. Um, I mean, Yes, it's a great uh, kind of development to have uh, Eastern Abre prosecuted in Senegal. But Senegal is not a model in terms of up, um, holding uh, uh, rule of law standards. And it just happened so that at the same time they were creating the special chambers to prosecute uh, Eastern Abre. There was another one to prosecute uh, um, Karim Wade. But there are so many things to say about those models. So. I think for me, those kind of the, the, the legacy of uh, those mixed or hybrid model uh, de well, will depend on how the entire system of the country is transformed. Because it's going to be difficult to say that we're going to have perfect kind of prosecution of international crime in a country that is partially democratic. Um, so for me, I accept that there are going to be innovative lab or, or, or innovation lab like, like um, um, uh, David said, but we need to look at a bigger picture. Uh, if we really want to have um, uh, proper prosecutions, if you want to have them uh, kind of anchored into domestic settings, we have to make an effort to transform those settings, most of which are really uh, uh, 
really mentoring. They are really element. They don't have uh, uh, all you need to have core purpose. So just this placing a model to make a point, it's fine. But in the long term, it may not really be uh, 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 sustainable. Which is actually a great point uh, and a good uh, segue to our panel at the end of the day. Our concluding panel really, uh, I think, is intended to try to struggle with these questions of international justice and broader uh, rule of law. Uh, yeah. So, Eric, uh, I'm going to give you the uh, final word before we open it up to the floor. Any reflections uh, on the last question or any of the uh, panelists' comments so far? Thank you. Um, I would echo the points about the importance of victim participation right from the outset, uh, even as a model is being designed. And, you know, I was so critical of not only in the Hobbit case, but um, uh, in others too. And the lack of victim participation, I think, has, has been a hindrance in, in other cases. Um, I think uh, there needs to be more caution about uh, governments that wish to make models and exercise in one-sided justice. Um, and so international vigilance helped, for example, in Sierra Leone with the setup of the special court. The government initially requested the court only to prosecute crimes committed uh, by rebel forces in Sierra Leone. Um, the mandate was broadened, and in fact, the court um, uh, prosecuted actors on both sides of the conflict. Um, it's, the experience has been less good uh, in countries like Cote d'Ivoire um, or Uganda, which uh, where the ICD you know, is, is not considering crimes committed by the uh, UPDF. Um, and another key lesson is that diplomat it's not enough for the diplomatic community to engage in establishing these mechanisms, but uh, needs to be engaged throughout uh, the, the course. Um, and diplomats can do a lot to offer support. And I think Guatemala has offered a good example of that, where um, diplomats have sat in the courtroom at the Rosemont trial, at the Sepulzarco trial, um, and sort of been a complement to the extensive victim engagement and supported those victim communities in important ways and made it much harder uh, for governments to subvert the trial and to make very clear that the world is watching these proceedings, um, that the, it, it implies that there will be repercussions um, if, if there are gross abnormalities in the proceedings um, and, and can be very helpful. I think in some other places uh, there hasn't been that kind of diplomatic follow through and that's, that's true uh, in domestic proceedings and, and in ICC proceedings for that matter. Thank you. Uh, thank you uh, to all the panelists. Um, let me now open the floor uh, to you and for your questions. There is a mic uh, here in the center uh, of the room. If you could introduce yourself and uh, briefly state your question in the form of a question uh, and to whom you would like uh, the, to whom you're directing your question. Hi, um, my name is Shabna. I'm with the Syria Justice and Accountability Center. And uh, as we can see um, in Syria right now in the negotiations, um, we're probably a long ways off from any sort of domestic prosecutions or hybrid tribunal prosecutions um, for the atrocities there. But um, given, I think, Reed, Eric, and everyone on the panel um, mentioned the importance of victim involvement, and given the uh, huge amount of displacement in Syria and the number of people that are now um, in Europe, neighboring countries that might not go back to Syria. Are there any lessons learned for victim engagement and uh, diaspora communities assisting with um, uh, you know, promoting international prosecutions uh, uh, you know, when, when, they're, when they're living outside of, outside of the country? Thank you. Uh, are there other uh, questions? I would, we might take a group of them uh, if there are other questions at the moment. If not, we'll, we'll go ahead and uh, go ahead and answer that, and then we'll come back to the audience. I'll pass them. Eric, do you want to start us off? 
Um, for sure. I mean, I think there are lessons uh, for the Syrian diaspora. I mean, I think one thing is that there are multiple venues um, for justice, and they might not be uh, adequate. Yeah, they, they, the amount of horizon that are adequate at this point, but I think uh, universal jurisdiction offers uh, one avenue for justice in Syria. Um, national jurisdictions uh, asserting uh, um, bringing cases on the basis of their nationals who have been involved as either victims or perpetrators of crimes in Syria. Um, and I think uh, there are a lot of groups uh, involved in documentation, including including yours. Um, and so clearly, the information is there to bring cases, and I think that that's one activity people can engage in. I think um, the other thing is preparing for the day when uh, broader opportunities open up. And uh, a sort of very general lesson that I think can be learned from other situations is that is that politics are not immutable. Um, people who are once beyond the reach of justice for political reasons, as President Assad and other perpetrators in Syria are now, uh, can they come into the reach of justice as political circumstances change. And with Charles Taylor, with uh, Slobodan Milosevic, with Zen Abre, Ron Bagbo, Ross Mont, uh, Pinochet, I mean, there's hope. It might take, um, unfortunately, decades. But, uh, you know, even if Assad is sent to Russia, um, political political situation where even could change and make him accessible at some point. Um, I would just add a, a few other comments uh, to Eric's. Um, one is, is that when we're in a situation where there's no venue um, or no single venue that will be charged with investigating and prosecuting um, a set of atrocity crimes, um, it's, it's also useful to think about what kind of investigations are necessary um, and what kind of evidence um, could be marshaled um, for a particular set of crimes. Um, I think with with the Habre case, um, the the cache of documents that Human Rights Watch found played an extraordinary role uh, in in proving um, uh, in in the prosecution's case for for Habre's responsibility. In other situations, um, there may be need to rely more on witness testimony, on testimonial evidence, um, and and in some cases, all of that will need to be relied on. So in, in some ways, to answer your question about what kinds of investigations and where they could take place, um, it, it, it will need to, you'll need to look at, at those questions as well. I, I would say the, the, the existence of the um, photos brought to light by the, the Syrian defector Caesar um, clearly show a very systematic um, perpetration of violations by, by the regime, one that was well documented in ways that we maybe have not seen uh, since, since uh, the Nazi crimes. Uh, and this will be an extraordinary useful um, evidence one day in improving and uh, in bringing perpetrators to account. Um, so there's, there's many ways to gather the kind of investigations, um, and there are many ways to look at different venues to pursue accountability. Uh, and as Eric says, doing that, even in the absence of a specifically designed venue is all the more essential. No, just the, the second half of the Roberto Garitone story that I told before was that he, he said, you know, for each of these 1,032 cases of habeas, of, of disappeared people, I filed a habeas corpus petition. I said, you know how many of them succeeded? None. I used to ask myself, why am I doing this? And now that Pinochet is in detention and we're here at the House of Lords, I realize why I did it. 
Um, and I think, you know, everybody's getting the message that you document things. I mean, not just victims, but also perpetrators. Human Rights Watch has done a lot of work on, on identifying mid-level perpetrators at torture centers in Syria. Um, obviously, it, you know, you need not just the crime base, but you need evidence of, um, of you know, command responsibility, of chain of command. You need to identify the people who one day will be exposed and, and vulnerable when they travel. Um, but, and, and, you know, the other day I was reading that in the South Sudan, there's a group that is, you know, listing and naming the victims of the South Sudan conflict. I'm sure this is being done all over the place, but this is the kind of work that will not go to waste. Thank you, Rebecca Chef from Human Rights First. In our work, we're often asked to articulate our concerns under, either under the rubric of international human rights law or the law of armed conflict. And with the models that we're discussing today, I would wonder if you could speak to your assessment of any differences in enforceability in international criminal law across these two frameworks or whether that distinction collapses. Thank you. I didn't take the next well, and then we can I'm Najwa Nabti, currently at the University of Arizona, but previously at the ICTY Office of the Prosecutor. Um, my question is directed to Reed. You mentioned um, the kind of uh, late discovery, at least of the extent of the sexual violence in the Hubre case, and yet these were um, you had sent out uh, female investigators, questioners. Um, I'd just like you to hear a little bit more about what you think those lessons learned are and if um, Human Rights Watch has you know, advice about how it might have proceeded differently uh, in retrospect. Hello, I'm Stephanie Ashton with a permanent mission of Columbia to the OAS. Um, Columbia came up briefly in the morning. Uh, a special jurisdiction for peace will be created, and this will include a tribunal with 20 national judges and four international judges. So it's a very broad question. Um, I'm, curious to hear what your recommendations are as to lessons learned and cautionary tales that um, would be valuable for the effort that Columbia is undertaking. I'm afraid I've had trouble hearing, so I'm going to pass to others. <laughs> I do have the mic over there. If you could just Enforceability uh, differences between uh, situations of international human rights law violations in LOAC. That question? Yeah. Um, sure. I'll, I'll I'll try to answer the first one. Um, the short answer is that I think it really depends on the legal framework uh, in which you're operating. Um, at times, uh, domestic legal frameworks are simply not um, equipped to, to encompass the full range of low act violations. Um, countries may not have domesticated uh, international provisions of international humanitarian law. Um, and I think actually Prosecutor Frigo this morning um, touched a bit on this. Uh, sometimes countries do not interpret their uh, jurisdiction uh, in, a, in, a, in a way that allows them to, to look retroactively at these crimes. Um, what that says to me, and, and one, one way in which that can possibly be addressed from a legal jurisdictional point of view is that sometimes internationalizing the chamber um, can provide a way to expand the, the temporal jurisdiction, at least, of some of these courts uh, and allow them to look further back in time at the violations that were committed. Um, on Colombia, I am by no means a Colombia expert, but I would 
offer that some lessons um, to be learned have to do with the sheer number of, of individuals and how you design a judicial process that's going to be able to meet uh, the goals of, of providing justice and ensuring that perpetrators are brought to account when it's simply not going to be possible to prosecute every perpetrator. This is not the first time that um, we've faced this dilemma. Um, and I think um, there have been various, various approaches to try, and, to try and do that. Some of them have been more successful than others. I think the Gachacha model in Rwanda um, was deeply flawed in many ways. Uh, was perhaps politicized uh, in many ways, but at the same time, it um, it offered a way um, to to broaden the the net of uh, of, of of perpetrators. Um, and there were simply speaking of due process and defendants' rights, uh, there was no way that the formal criminal justice system at that time would have been able to do that. So they're, they're, for Colombia, I would say that's going to be a central dilemma in designing a process um, that achieves justice, but, but is also effective. Thank you. Um, in terms of the question about sexual violence, this is, I really, I mean, I, I, I can express my regrets for what we didn't do, but there are people in the audience like Patricia Sellers who could much better equipped to just to say how it should be done. Um, I would say that for the longest time, nobody really believed that Hiss and Habre was going to go to trial. And um, that obviously, um, I mean, as we expected and predicted, um, the closer trial, the, the more that it looked like trial, that he actually would go to trial, the more people were willing to come forward and say things that they had never said before. Um, I mean, the, the one woman who, who, who said that Habre raped her, she, I mean, she had told me for years, she said, if I, you know, if I ever have the fortune to be in front of that man, I'm going to say things that, that will really shock you. So, I mean, we kind of knew in her case what she was going to say, but, but many of the others we didn't. I, I don't know. I would, I, it, maybe you want to, it's called a stress. Yeah. Well, I don't have much to say. Maybe just one thing for Colombia is to be careful about the amnesty, um, amnesty process. I think the process took place in Uganda, northern Uganda, and you know, and did not really produce much. But the process is, well, it takes long. And um, the whole balance of uh, justice and peace is the the one thing that's gonna be the main problem how to try to to achieve both but I mean um, good luck um, Eric uh, have you been able to hear the last part of our conversation uh, some of it yes okay so uh, we uh, have run out of time but I want to give you uh, the floor if you have any other comment to make uh, on any of the questions or the panelists remarks um, just very briefly, I mean, I want to echo the point about uh, the importance of a prosecutorial strategy in uh, Colombia um, because of the sheer numbers of, of perpetrators. Um, and just sort of generally, lessons as, as one contemplates bringing internationals in, uh, there's some fairly mundane lessons. I mean, I mentioned some earlier, but you know, we're not bringing people on a on a six-month contract or a one-year contract um, because they're never going to get up to speed and by the time they're up to speed, if they do get up to speed, then they're leaving. Uh, you know, the, there's a tendency sometimes when internationals are brought in that work is split up between international teams and national teams rather than having teams work in an integrated fashion and that should be avoided, obviously, if the goal is, um, is to, to bring 
more independence through the international involvement and um, to have some opportunity for mutual learning. Thank you, uh, Eric, and uh, please join me in thanking the panel for their insightful remarks this morning. Thank you very, very much. Just a word about logistics as we proceed. Uh, we have uh, lunch in the hall uh, right outside this room.